everyone, I'm Sarah Levon and welcome back to my YouTube channel. If this is your first time here, welcome. Make sure you subscribe down below so that you never miss a future video because today I am answering your questions from YouTube comments and then from Instagram. Today we are gonna talk about a lot of really fun things. We talk about caffeine in pregnancy. We are gonna talk about postpartum depression in men. That comes from my previous last video on postpartum depression versus baby blues. We talk about postpartum hemorrhage. You had a lot of questions about postpartum hemorrhage, IUDs, increasing your milk supply, but without creating an oversupply and problems with your breastfeeding. We talk about evening primrose oil. You guys have been asking me that one for a really long time. Finally, I answered it. All that and more. If you have another question that you want answered, make sure you throw it in the comment box down below for a future potential coffee and questions video. And then, let's get started. All right, so we are gonna go right into Instagram and get to your questions because you guys, every single time I put out a poll, I get more and more responses. So we are never gonna run out of questions to answer, particularly from Instagram, but even from the YouTube comments. So if you haven't been commenting before, go ahead and comment below on this video and that will, that will also kind of like gear me up to try to find your question because I'm getting a lot. Daily Haley 95 says, how can I build a small stash of breast milk without creating an oversupply? Okay, this is very like, I'm gonna try to summarize this one in a way that you can understand very quickly. So the goal with creating more milk, but not an oversupply to a place where like your breasts are so full and you have like way, way too much and now you're trying to like decrease your supply without risking your supply. The goal would be to very slowly like add maybe five minutes at the end of two pumps and start that. And you're gonna need to kind of figure out what your body does. Remember, the way breast milk works is by supply and demand. So whatever baby's been removing up until this point is how much your body knows how to make. So the goal is to tell your body, make like a tiny bit more, but don't make like a whole whopping lot more. And so we want to feed the baby, and then put a pump on and massage the breast because you wanna get the hind milk out. And so like whatever baby has removed from the fr front part of the breast, you wanna get that back part of the breast. And so you're gonna massage out, get a little bit, no more than five minutes and start there, do both sides. And do that for, and you can even start with one pump a day. You can try two pumps, then you're kind of risking oversupply. The other thing is I need to get them as a sponsor, Haka, I'm talking to you. The Haka is literally my favorite product of all time, I've brought it up a million times. If you don't have a haka, you need a haka. It is $13, it's on my Amazon list. You can go down to the description box, it's down there, it's on the breastfeeding list. And what it is, wait, I have one. Hold on, I'm gonna get it. So I got my fake booby here, okay? This I just got in the mail from China. It needs some like powder or something, it's kind of getting sticky. And then this is the haka, this is the small one. I think there's a three and a four ounce. Get the, oh no, this is the four ounce. Just kidding, get the four ounce, get the bigger one. And then what it looks like, this is not sponsored by the way, Haka, feel free to reach out because I love you. So this is all it is, okay? It's silicone, it's like this little smushy thing and what you do is get baby on one side, <laughs> then you have booby on the other side and you squeeze it like this, find the nipple and, and suction the nipple on the other side. So it's gonna hurt probably if it's not centered, like this nipple's getting real smushed. So don't do that. Re take it off and kind of decrease the suction pressure. And then you just wanna line it up so the nipple's in the middle. There we go. And then what it does is, it's this gentle suction pressure that this is gonna pull out a little bit more milk and it's without creating oversupply. I don't know if I've ever heard of anybody creating an oversupply with a haka. If you do, then that's probably, it would be with a haka or without a haka. Um, but then you're pulling out, you're increasing your milk supply a little bit over time when baby goes to this side. You de take it off. If there's enough milk in there, you can dump it out, save it, go to the other side, connect it on the boob, and, and then let it sit there because it sits on its own, just kind of sucked on there. Okay, so the Haka, I know I've mentioned this a million times, guys, but like everybody, this is a one registry item. It's $13 worth every penny. This will help with like a not getting too much milk issue, but just kind of stimulating the breast enough because you wanna tell the breast, hey, make a little bit more so you can start saving without like kind of like being like, whoa, I'm feeding a village. 
Now, if you make too much milk, then you can always tell your body to make a little bit less, but it's better to have a little more than have a little less without risking engorgement or mastitis or any of those other complications. So you wanna build the small stash with the Hakka, best thing you can do. The other thing you can do is hand express at the end of every feed, just get out a little bit more. That's gonna tell your body to make a little more next time. And then slowly but surely, your milk supply will increase. And then slowly but surely, that milk supply in the fridge or the freezer also increases. Bactopia says, what can I do to help my partner when, I, when I'm in labor and he's not good with blood? So first of all, your partner should be helping you in labor. You shouldn't have to really help your partner in labor. This is why you do a lot of the prep work. You take your classes, you get your birth preferences list together and on your birth preferences, throw this on your birth preferences and say, look, my partner, he's not very good with blood. He might pass out, whatever your symptoms are. And then partner, Bactopia's partner, you need to be aware that if you start feeling lightheaded, if you feel like dizzy, if you're like, uh-oh, I'm not okay, you need to sit down, put your head between your legs, have some juice handy, make sure you're eating regularly, don't lock your knees. And because we don't, as a nursing team, like we definitely don't wanna take care of you. We only know really how to take care of pregnant people. And so if you go down, you're going to the emergency department, you're hitting your head, like please don't do that, okay? We don't want more drama in your birth. Birth is dramatic enough. And so know yourself, and then I would say put that on a birth preference list, and then have your nurses know ahead of time that he's not good with blood, so that if there's gonna be a blood draw, or if it's gonna be sort of bloody, they can place him at a, at a place in the room or whatever where he's not gonna see so much of that blood, and then you just have to know for yourself. Don't try to be a hero. Sit yourself down, put your head between your legs, and wait a second, and it should pass. Uh, Shevins815 says, how will a retroverted uterus affect my delivery? I know I have one, but I don't know what that means. Okay, so your uterus is normally about this big, okay? And we'll go with like boob big because I have it here, okay? Imagine your uterus is this big. I won't distract you with the nipple. It's this big normally, and then when it gets pregnant, it gets to be like full balloon size. Okay, when you're pregnant, the uterus can be he like directly up and down. It can be retroverted or it can be antiverted. And that just means that it's like, it kind of like moves its way or it's, it's turned or curved one direction. When you're not pregnant, you're gonna see that on ultrasound. Now what happens though is when your uterus expands, all of that like backward motion or forward motion, depending on which way it is, so it's not just directly up and down, it's probably going to straighten out with the growth of the pregnancy in your uterus. So it really means nothing, okay? No stress, antiverted, retroverted uteruses. We think, okay, cool, when you're not pregnant, noted. Sometimes it can make you have a harder time getting pregnant or sometimes you're at increased risk for miscarriage, but otherwise, when you're pregnant, usually it means nothing. Speaking of coffee and questions, uh, this isn't Karina. I wonder what your actual name is if it isn't Karina. Uh, coffee and trying to conceive. Should I avoid caffeine altogether? So this goes with my trying to conceive video. And I will speak sort of to that for trying to conceive, but I'm also gonna talk to pregnancy for all of you that are pregnant. Speaking of coffee and questions as I'm drinking my coffee. Mm -hmm. So trying to conceive, you don't, probably need to decrease, unless you're drinking like a whole lot of coffee. So I suppose if you're drinking like a ton, a ton of coffee, cut back one, two cups a day is totally fine. Um, mind you, if you're really having a hard time conceiving, then that's when you do wanna think about what are the things that you're putting in your body that may that may upset your hormones, that may influence your body in one way or another? And it wouldn't be a terrible idea just to cut it out. You'll survive. I don't know if I would, but you will survive. And then just see what happens. Um, but if you're trying to conceive and you're just like worried about it, you can have one, two cups a day. Like don't even worry about it. Now, if you're pregnant, Different doctors are gonna have different recommendations, so always check with your doctor. That's always my general disclaimer. But the recommendation is no more than 200 milligrams a day, which is about two cups, I think. It might be four cups. No, I'm pretty sure it's two cups. 200 milligrams a day, you can look. And different coffee drinks have different milligrams of caffeine in them. And so you do kind of want to check it out. Like Starbucks, if you go to the Starbucks app or their nutrition guide, they'll tell you. Um, and then like, you know, like on your bought and coffee drinks or whatever, there's different cups of coffee. So look into that. And then if you start to feel like you're having palpitations, if you feel like baby's overly active and you don't like it, then you might want to cut back just all in moderation. Now, some doctors are going to say no caffeine in pregnancy. That's totally up to you. But in general, you can have a little bit of caffeine. Maddie Rose 97 says hemorrhaging. How can you prevent it? Why does it happen? Coming at you from down under. Hello, Australia. 
I think I may be going to Australia in 2020, by the way, FYI. So more to come on that, stay tuned because I'd love to meet all of you. Um, so hemorrhaging meaning bleeding too much. So there is a normal amount of blood loss that we expect when you have a baby, that be via vaginal birth or via cesarean birth. Because the placenta, I need more props. Because the placenta is connected to the side of your uterus. And this is your baby's blood flow. This is your baby's lifeline. And so there's about 700 milliliters of blood that gets pumped between you and your body through to the baby to the cord to keep baby alive. And so when the baby's born and this is disconnected, meaning the cord is cut and it's just chilling inside, your body's like, yo, I don't need this organ anymore. So the placenta is gonna detach. It's gonna be not sticky anymore and it's gonna come out. You're gonna deliver it. Doesn't feel like the, ba the baby delivering. It feels like a little like slither, slither out your vagina. And then there's all of these arteries and veins that are just open to the world to bleed like crazy. And so what your uterus needs to do is it needs to have one big contraction. And so that's why after birth, it's actually the highest level of oxytocin you'll ever experience in your entire life because we want your body to give you that one big, huge contraction to close off all those arteries and veins and prevent you from bleeding too much. In general, one liter of blood loss is normal. It used to be 500 for a vaginal birth and 1,000 milliliters or one liter for a C-section, but now they've just kind of said, if it's a liter, you're fine. Now, mind you, that does depend on if you're anemic ahead of time, what your blood counts were, your hemoglobin and hematocrit was before birth. But in general, we expect you to bleed after you give birth. That's why your body actually increases its blood volume in pregnancy to prepare for this detachment and then the bleeding that takes place after birth. Now, anything more than a thousand milliliters is considered a hemorrhage, which is too much blood loss. And so there are lots of reasons for this. Usually I would say probably the number one reason why women hemorrhage or they bleed a little more than normal is because of this connection and that uterus not clamping down to close off those openings. It's called uterine atony. And so with that, it's atonis. Is that a word? To be atonis? <laughs> That's not a word, I don't think. That doesn't sound right. <laughs> Basically, your uterus doesn't clamp down and doesn't close off those openings. And so that could be because you had a really long labor. That could be because you've had twins. That could be because you had other complications in your pregnancy. You had an infection. Long labors with Pitocin, so you were induced or augmented with Pitocin, which is the fake form of oxytocin. I talk about all of that in my childbirth class. If you haven't taken that, you definitely need a childbirth class. And so because of the Pitocin being there for a long time in your uterus being like, I have had so many hundreds of thousands of contractions and now I had the baby, thank God, and now I'm just tired. I don't feel like contracting anymore. And so usually that's the reason for a hemorrhage. Now there are other reasons why, and we can get into that in a future like all about hemorrhage video. If you want that, let me know in the comment box down below. Um, but in general, it's usually because of that, this situation. SMH Adventures says along those same postpartum hemorrhage lines says, what are the signs of postpartum hemorrhage? She said, I wasn't sure what was postpartum hemorrhage po versus post delivering all natural with a long labor. It's a great question. So along those lines with postpartum, postpartum hemorrhage, um, the difference would be, and kind of the rule of thumb is that you shouldn't be filling one of those large pads in an hour or less. If you start feeling lightheaded, if your partner maybe looks at you and is like, you look really pale, or you feel really nauseous, those are all things that you definitely need to let your nurses know. I would say for you, if you're in a labor and delivery room, I would hope that your nurse is gonna be on top of that, watching your bleeding. They should be checking your bleeding every 15 minutes, and they're the ones that are recognizing signs of postpartum hemorrhage. For you, if you feel gushing out your your vagina where it's just pouring out of you or you're you're delivering delivering you're you're releasing your there's a lot of clots coming out of you like big lumpy balls of blood coming out of you in like chunks then that also is abnormal and would be something definitely to report to your nurse if you're in the hospital and then if you're at home and you have some clot you pass some clots you feel lightheaded you're kind of gushing blood or there's an increase in your blood that would be abnormal and something to call your doctor about Katie Perkins 15 says tips on giving birth as naturally as possible, but in a hospital versus at home. Okay, this is great. This is gonna be a whole video. Okay, first of all, stay home until you're actually in labor. And so that's where go back to my 
when to go to the hospital video slash take my childbirth class because my childbirth class is gonna make it very, very clear and practical for you to know when to exactly go to the hospital so you're not there too early. You don't wanna be there too early. In fact, you would rather be there too late so long as the baby's moving, you don't have vaginal bleeding and your doctor's okay with it. So stay home, get a doula, okay? If you are trying to go as naturally as possible, and I assume that means that without an epidural but also avoiding medical interventions, you take that childbirth class, you get a doula, you wait at home with your doula, that will help you. And then you also, you need a coping with labor class. It's like you wouldn't run a marathon without running some miles ahead of time. I always say that as an example, but it's like training for something that's very intense. It's very life changing, but it will be probably one of the hardest things you ever do in your life, just being real with you. And so you need some training on that. My tip is learn, have some tools in your toolbox. If you can't afford a doula, then take the coping with labor class and have your partner feel even more confident with some tools to help you along the way. Wait at home and then let your nurses know that that's what you want. You're probably gonna have to advocate for yourself. It kind of depends on where you deliver. Right here in LA, People are pretty open and very like, whatever you want. Yes, of course, but the stories I hear from a lot of other places in the United States and all over the world is much more uh, pushy maybe, or much more like maybe they haven't seen people deliver without an epidural as much. And so know your environment, talk to your doctor. That's another one. Make sure your doctor's on board and they know what you want. And then when you get there to the hospital, talk to the nurses and be prepared to advocate for yourself. Nope, I'm good. Nope, this and that. Now, mind you, advocate with reason because we want a healthy mom and a healthy baby. And so you're asking the right questions and you have that those tools to be able to facilitate a conversation that you feel good about, not just doing things because you are in a hospital, because you're the patient and they're telling you what to do. Oh, this is super easy. Aurora La 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 says, why is it bad to use baby powder slash talc on babies? Two reasons. One is it gets in their lungs. It's up in their, it's in, up in the air and then it gets into their airway. It's not good for their airway. And two, it fosters bacteria. So it sits there and then bacteria sticks to it. It's all moist down there and it gets all bacteria infested, more chance of yeast infections, bacterial infections. So no more baby powder. We say pass on the powder. No baby powder is necessary. Just make sure they're all nice and aired out after you've changed their diaper. You can throw some butt paste on there, some diaper rash cream if they have a diaper rash. Otherwise, just let them be. Oxygen heals. We like oxygen. Let the oxygen do its work. You don't need baby powder. Savvy Haas says, what can I expect with a labor down delivery? So laboring down, if you've heard this terminology, what that means is you get to 10 centimeters, so there's nothing blocking the baby from coming down into the vagina, but instead of starting to push right away, that you wait a little for the contractions to hopefully bring the baby a little lower so that you don't have to push as long, you're less exhausted, and it's less work on you. So she said, what can you, she expect? You would expect to get to 10 centimeters, then check you and go, okay, let's wait, let's labor you down for an hour to two hours and then start pushing. Um, the alternative would be, now mind you, this would be probably with an epidural. If you have an epidural, you can do that. If you don't have an epidural and they're telling you not to push when you're 10 centimeters, like that's not probably very realistic because that urge is gonna come and you're gonna be like, I'm trying to labor the baby down and I can't help it, I gotta put my baby out. And so you're probably just gonna wanna, probably meaning you are, just gonna wanna go with your instinct, listen to your provider clearly as they tell you like what to do, but at the same time, like your instinct is everything. And so without an epidural, it's probably not very realistic to labor down. Um, but you do want to wait for the urge to push. So some people too, even without an epidural, now that I'm thinking about it, sometimes don't have the urge to push right away. And so we need the baby to be low enough in the pelvis that you're not pushing for hours and hours and hours. Danae Bovey says, are silicone nipple shields necessary for breastfeeding? The answer is no, they are not necessary. So by a nipple shield, we're talking about kind of this same material, but probably a little bit thinner that just sticks onto your nipple and then makes it so that there's like a silicone-y type sticky outy thing for the baby to latch onto. The problem with nipple shields is that then you become dependent upon something. And what I want for you is to be totally independent, not dependent on your breast friend pillow and not dependent on your nipple shield, that you could take your baby anywhere, breastfeed them, survive, live your best life and not feel so stressed out, right? And so only if you have inverted nipples, meaning like instead of the nipple popping out, like this, it's a nipple day today. <laughs> that instead of the nipple popping out like this, instead it's actually like inward. 
like that. And so if that's the case, you do need something for baby to grab onto, but even flat nipples, honestly, like I could suck on my arm and baby can still latch on. So that's where like inverted nipples, that's what a nipple shield is for. But if a, if a nipple shield comes out, I would just say, hold it loosely. A lot of times, and I'm, I'm calling out you nurses here, which by the way, I have an announcement at the end of this video, stay tuned. Um, but you nurses here, like a lot of times it's laziness on the nurse's behalf. If you're having a hard time latching your baby, then you pull out a nipple shield, baby's gonna latch on a lot quicker, a lot easier, but then you become dependent on it. It is not necessary. Most of the time you can get the baby on. It may take some maneuvering and some helping to create more nipple by squeezing the breast in the right way. With some added support, you probably don't need a nipple shield. Now, if you need a nipple shield, no stress in that either. I just don't want you to become dependent upon different items like that you feel like you need to buy and bring with you everywhere and then you're stressed out if you don't have them with you. This one guys I've gotten for a long time and I've sort of avoided for a while. This is my last one and then we'll go to YouTube. So Brielle Rihanna says, does evening primrose oil work to help with thinning your cervix or tearing? Y'all ask, like I can scroll through and I can find a lot on evening prim primrose oil. So evening primrose oil is either ingested or put into the vagina like a suppository. And so there really isn't enough information about evening primrose oil to really make a recommendation here or there. In fact, when you look at the data, it's actually very mixed as far as like some, it's like, oh yeah, it helps to ripen the cervix and others it actually increased complications. And so general recommendation is just stay away guys. I know that you are desperate to have your babies and that you want to be able to control and do whatever you can to try to get this baby out. And so if you haven't seen my other FAQ about letting go, we need to let go and trust our bodies that you have all the tools inside of you, your own natural hormones, your baby is working with you to help stimulate labor when the time is right. And so doing all the extra things and risking potential complications probably just isn't worth it. Let go, let your body do what it needs to do and trust that labor in this baby is coming. You will not be pregnant forever. It is coming in the right time at the right place when it is supposed to. All right, now we're going to YouTube. So let me pull up your YouTube comments. Um, and if I, just so you know, I specifically do go to this last coffee and questions on every coffee and question. So if you have a question that you're like, please Sarah, answer my question, go to a previous coffee and questions, like the most recent one, and then just keep asking it. And hopefully at some point I will see it. Mm, this is a good one. Okay. So this comes from C-section recovery, what to expect tips for healing and more. This is from, um, Bika E. She says, is it okay to use belly belts after a C-section? If so, how many days can we use it? Or after how many days can we use it? If I try to do a video on this, post hard, blah, 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 okay. Um, so yes, it's okay to use a belly belt. And by a belly belt, I assume you mean like a belly binder, kind of like a corset style support garment after you give birth. I have some of these on my postpartum Amazon list. So you can check out over there in the hospital. They're probably going to give you the same thing. And basically what it is, it's just Velcro. It comes around your corset, your abdomen, and it's going to hold everything together. The key is if you guys have those, like remember back in the day, there were those like corset style, like the, the waist trainers. And those were super popular, like thanks to the Kardashians and stuff where people were trying to get their waist like <laughs> sucked up and they were wearing these things for hours and hours upon hours a day. Don't do that, okay? We're not talking like, like really strong and tight around your abdomen. We want support. Think of it as a support garment that's adding pressure and bracing your incision for you. It's probably gonna help with your recovery. It's gonna help your organs to feel a little more stable. Even after a vaginal birth, you can wear this as well. And you can wear them right away. I would just say that you, you're not wearing them 24 seven, wear them for a few hours on and off. If you go out or you're up and you're moving, it's helpful to have it on. And then at nighttime, maybe take it off. And then if you're starting to feel sore, if your incision starts feeling sore, either loosen it up or just give it a break. And so this is kind of trial and error, but absolutely you can wear it from the beginning and it probably will help your recovery. Oh, this is an easy coughing question. Okay. She wanted a whole video, but Alyssa Page says, do you have a video on recovery from a C-section and getting your tubes tied at the same time? <laughs> it's the same thing. You're not even gonna know the difference. So getting your tubes tied, first of all, in the United States, 
at least in California, you're gonna have to ask your doctor about this, but if you want your tubes tied, especially if you know you're, you're gonna have a C-section, make sure you sign the consent, the paperwork, a month ahead of time prior to when your scheduled date is, because the paperwork needs to be done ahead of time. So what you do is you just say, yep, I want my tubes tied, and then once the baby's out, they're gonna go in, they're gonna find the fallopian tube, they're gonna like fold it in half, tie it off, snip, snip, cauterize the end, that's it, do the other side, send them to path, and that's it. That's literally it. You know no difference. It will not make a difference to your recovery. It is the easiest thing in the entire world if you have a C-section. As far as recovery goes from an actual just bilateral tubal ligation is what it's called when you go in and you maybe you didn't have a C-section, you're just having strictly that surgery to get your tubes tied. All they do is they make an incision like this big by your belly button, they go in, they find the tube, snip, snip, decauterize, da, 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 tie to that do the other side, send it off to the lab, same thing. And then you're like going home that same day, okay? You throw a Band-Aid on the incision, they'll, they'll stitch it up usually, and then that's it. You're laying low for the next little bit, and then your recovery is very easy, actually. Um, so for a C-section, no big deal. Doing it on its own, not even really a big deal. It's a very simple procedure. Oh, that's a good one too. Okay, you guys have such good questions. Um, how, this is from how they induce labor in the hospital, what to expect from your induction. Ashley Hernandez says, can you still walk around with Cervidil insert and Cytotec? So I just wanna clarify, you wouldn't do both. It would be one or the other. If they try to do both, that's not okay. It's one or the other. And the answer is yes, of course you can still walk around. What they're probably gonna have you do and what I suggest if they don't have you do it, before they insert either one, one or the other, make sure you pee because we want you in bed for 30 minutes to an hour. There's different hospital protocols because we want, like imagine it's in your vagina in here. We put it inside, it sits there. We want it to kind of like soften and like absorb some of the vagina juices and like kind of get stuck there versus you put it in and then it fall out. The other little tiny precaution I would say from the nursing standpoint is if you have a Cervidil, which is the one with the string, just make sure that when you go to the bathroom, you're not like wiping super hard or you're not like, ooh, what's this little white string and pull on it and like, oops, there went my Cervidil. Because especially with that, you want it placed correctly up around like in the end of the vagina. If it sits in the vagina anyway, your vagina is gonna get super duper duper sensitive. Like where anybody goes to touch you and you're like, ooh and it's not okay. So you want it to stay up there, and so sit down for a little bit, don't tug on the string, and then yes, of course, you can get up and move. Oh, uh, it's Erica Saris says, this comes from the VBAC uterine rupture risks, what makes it an option or not, and more. Um, she says, what are your opinions on obese patients attempting a VBAC? She says, I know that obese patients have a harder time laboring and not progressing. She's done tons of research. La -di da um, So first of all, I would say that to take my VBAC class, because I talk all about induction, I talk about VBAC for obese patients, what makes you more and less likely. So second of all, the answer would be my opinion, which I, I don't know this is necessarily my opinion, but I would say from my experience, that if you wanna go for a VBAC, I think you should go for a VBAC. That if you came in and I was your nurse and you were attempting a VBAC, I don't know that I would think anything differently about how we approach the VBAC. In fact, for obese patients, it's actually safer to have a vaginal birth if you can get the vaginal birth. And so labor progress, schmogress, set yourself up for that vaginal birth, do all the things you can do to get it. It really doesn't make a difference. If you are obese and you wanna labor and have a VBAC, then go for it. Oh, 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 such a good another question. You guys are killing me with these questions. Okay, Dahlia Rodriguez says, hello, I'm 33 weeks pregnant on my second baby and I've learned so much from your videos. But I have a question, after I give birth, is it possible to get an IUD right away or do you have to wait a certain time? you can get it right away. So this is actually something that was recently being started in my hospital prior to leaving and starting Bundle Birth, a nursing corporation. And so you can talk to your doctor if you know you want an IUD, make sure that they have it there at the hospital, that you have access to it because once the baby comes out vaginally, they can literally just like stick it in. You don't even know, especially if you have an epidural, but even if you don't have an epidural, it's the easiest thing in the world. Your cervix is a little bit dilated, probably like a little more than a little bit dilated, super easy. Now the risk is that it does have a higher risk of expulsion or falling out, which is always the risk with an IUD. And so you wanna be super careful, super aware um, that you know, that you're, 
like that if you see it come out, like that you tell them <laughs> and then you'll have to reinsert it. But in general, it can be done literally in the delivery room. The other thing is that when you go back for your six week postpartum visit, which by the way, there's new laws coming out that uh, look like you probably will be seen somewhere around three weeks instead of six weeks as well, which is awesome. So when you go back for your three or your six week appointment, they will be talking to you about birth control and I would just make sure that you've had that conversation ahead of time and then be prepared that they can throw it in not literally like a dart, <laughs> like, you know, go in there, insert the IUD so that you're nice and protected and you don't get pregnant too early, more than you want to be. Okay, Amanda May says, hey Sarah, will you please make a video on addressing postpartum depression for men, i.e. husbands or partners? A friend of mine's husband is really struggling with everything involving babies since she was born and it got me thinking about how this is such a rare topic in postpartum depression discussions. So thank you so much for bringing this up because I did mention very briefly in the last video on postpartum depression versus post or baby blues that it can happen for men. And so this is where the difference really is in the pathophysiology that men, you're not going through the hormonal changes of having a uterus and carrying a pregnancy and delivering the baby, but having a baby is extremely stressful. It's an extreme change on your life, an extreme change on your relationships and your emotions and your sleep schedule. So a lot of those same things that mom's going through, you're also going through, and you also need to be nurtured in that time and have the support for yourself knowing that even though you didn't deliver the baby, you now are responsible for this human and that can be really stressful. And so a lot of the same things apply as far as what you can be doing. And that's finding that balance for the two of you of what is your new relationship dynamic look like. And if you need to step away and get some fresh air and do some self care, that you would help each other out to also have that same boundary between each other to help to have that same time. The other thing is social support. And then there is seeing a therapist that I'm all about, about seeking out professional support. I said before, I see a therapist regularly for my own mental health because there's nothing worth your mental health. If you are struggling, talk to your primary doctor, call your insurance company. A lot of times with insurance, you don't need a referral. Even if you need a referral for other specialists, for mental health services, you usually don't need a referral. So find somebody that you can talk to. Talk to other dads and explain and be open and talk about this stuff, guys. And a lot of times I think, I think especially with guys, there's even more shame about talking about your feelings or that you're struggling. And I just want to say that it's okay, that it's going to take some courageous men to open up that conversation and recognize that like, yeah, we need to be talking about these issues. What does it feel like to be a dad? What does the financial strain maybe feel like? Um, what does it feel like to be a partner when you're not the one breastfeeding and maybe you feel left out and kind of like, well, now all of her priority is to the baby and where does our relationship stand. So there's so many different dynamics of what we could get into that for, but I would say that go back and watch that video. A lot of the same things apply of setting boundaries with your visitors, knowing your own limits, partners, meaning pregnant now, now not pregnant person, recognizing like what's going on, having some of these conversations, processing any kind of birth trauma, if there was hard stuff that happened in the birth, and then seeking out that help to really do that talk therapy, and then potentially maybe more if needed. But start with some of the more mild stuff like the self-care, the sunlight, the talking to your friends, the like getting back to what your normal routine looks like. And then you may need to seek out a therapist and talk to somebody and you may need some more aggressive treatment such as medications, not always medications, everyone freaks out about medications, but there's no shame in taking medications either if this is really truly affecting your life, your relationships, your bonding with your baby. There's no shame in that game. You are not alone, you are not to blame and with help it will get better. Thank you guys for being with me here today. If you want more from me, you know the regular spiel. You can go to my website. I have childbirth classes over there, VBAC class, coping with labor class, guys. I think a lot of times there's people that have told me like, why would I need a class if I'm watching your YouTube videos? And if you are a dedicated follower of mine, you're getting so much information here, guys. But there is plenty, meaning like the entire system process of labor and birth that I just don't have time to go over and I go over in my entire childbirth class. So go over there, check that out, get educated and ready and confident. The other big announcement I have for you is if you are a labor and delivery nurse, we are branching into, we meaning me, myself, and my team of Bundle Birth are branching into nursing trainings. And I'm so excited because I, I'm, I've been here educating you guys for however long. And it's one thing to be able to teach you what to do and say in the hospital, but if you get to the hospital and your nurses are opposing everything that you do and they don't have the same education that you have, then
then you're not gonna be able to do as much, you're not gonna have as many options in the hospital. And so I want everyone to be on the same page. And because I'm a nurse, I do feel like I have a unique voice to be able to speak to both sides, the patient and the medical world. And so January 2020, we will have our very first nursing training here in Los Angeles. Everything will be in the description box down below. If you are a labor and delivery nurse, if you are an aspiring labor and delivery nurse, if you know one, share that with them. We gotta get the word out because I would love to see you there and help you feel more confident and ready with some tools, some practical things you can literally walk into the bedside the next day and apply to your patients to help them have the most positive birth experience but also get that vaginal birth. If you haven't subscribed already, go ahead and subscribe down below. If you have any other questions, throw them in the comment box down below. If you haven't followed me on Instagram, go over to Instagram because I am updating all the time on there on stories. I'm answering questions. I have way more content over there. Uh, we're talking postpartum. I answer questions. I do live. So go over there. You can find more information over there. And until next time, don't forget to flex and flow and I will see you soon. Bye. I got you. I got you. And then I come back and you okay. cut in and I'm like, here's my boob. <laughs> That's what I got on that one. The more, more, if you haven't, uh, bleh, bleh. <laughs> question, okay, we need to cut all that out. I'm 32, <laughs> if you haven't, uh, bleh, bleh. is that fine? Yeah. I hope that answered your question. <laughs>